welcome everyone. I'm excited uh, that you have joined us. Um, this webinar is um, part of um, Safe Mushroom Foraging Program. Uh, we have this beautiful guide that um, you can either download or um, get a paper copy. Um, but before we go further, I should introduce myself. My name is Ina Rodriguez Salamanca, uh, and I am a diagnostician with the Plant and Insect Diagnostic Clinic, um, and I love mushrooms. So let me tell you a little bit um, about where I'm coming from. I am um, the person that does the mushroom identification with the Plant and Insect Diagnostic Clinic. Uh, we focus mainly on uh, identifying mushrooms that are related with trees or uh, turf or lawns. And so people always want to know what to do about them. But in my role, I can't really make recommendations on edibility uh, of wild mushrooms um, because of the liability. Um, and we can either uh, identify mushrooms in households uh, or associated with food production. And because we don't have the manpower we can do identifications of photo only submissions for mushrooms. So because of this um, restrictions, uh, but because of the number of people that contact us about mushroom is that we decided to come up with uh, this publication so that you can get started um, learning about mushrooms and more than anything, um, making sure that you understand the risks that are associated to eating uh, wild mushrooms. Uh, and so that you are informed and learn what are the important steps on identifying mushrooms. So today we're going to talk quickly about mushrooms, discuss edibility, toxicity, and sensitivity, and then we're going to go over uh, common fall mushrooms in Iowa. Most people think that it's only about more else in the spring, but the truth is a lot of mushrooms may be available in the fall under the right conditions if we get enough rain and enough moisture for the mushrooms to develop. All right, and I should tell you, we always have to give you this disclaimer. When you're eating, when you choose to eat a mushroom, you are responsible for ensuring that that mushroom has been properly identified um, and knowing that some of these mushrooms may cause you an allergic reaction or, or um, it could be poisonous. And so you are acknowledging that you're consuming any wild mushroom at your own risk. Okay, having said that, uh, let's talk about mushrooms. So mushrooms are fruiting bodies of certain fungi. And a lot of what we see, um, or that you see in the literature, or you'll see in the woods, um, are mushrooms, um, that meaning cap with gills. But you may see other, other kinds like puffballs or bolites. Um, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just gonna refer to all of these kinds as mushrooms. But fungi, fungi are not able to produce their own food like plants do. Fungi are major recyclers in nature, decomposers. But the truth is that a lot of what I do in the plant clinic has to do with those fungi that are harm harmful to plants. So between among those roles, we have those that are plant pathogens or are parasites or harmful to trees or plants in general. Um, and the fungi can be, you know, big in size like mushrooms or microscopic, like a lot of the pathogens that I uh, deal with in my daily routine at the plant clinic. Some of those mushrooms or fungi uh, could be beneficial. Some of you may have heard of mycorrhizae, um, mushrooms that, or fungi that will interact very closely with the root system of plants and trees and then they will share food, nutrients, and water. So we consider that beneficial. Um, there are other uh, fungi that are decomposers or saprophytic, saprotes, um, and that is a phenomenal role of fungi in nature because they help recycle uh, all the wood in the forest that no longer, um, any plants and trees that are no longer alive. And then there are some fungi that we just simply don't know what is their role in nature. But the truth is that uh, fungi are fascinating uh, and there's a lot that we can learn from them. So fungi is, we're talking about that these organisms are generally microscopic. And what we won't see in the, in the woods is this thread-like hyphae 
um, that forms this ginormous network of mycelia that very often is in the ground um, or in some cases associated with wood. And after they have, the, the fungi have amounted enough resources um, and it's ready to reproduce and make spores or seeds of that fungi, if you will, so that those spores or seeds will go somewhere else to establish a new colony, um, then those mushrooms will be produced and the spores are produced on those mushrooms. So a lot of this characteristics is what we use to identify mushrooms and fungi in general, how the fungal bodies look like, their spores, their color, their shape, the size of, that, of the spores, uh, and so forth. So when we talk about those macroscopic bodies or mushrooms as, as I am referring them, there's two main kinds that I want you to um, learn about. The first group is called Basidiomycota, and that is mushrooms that will produce the spores on this specific structure called a basidium. So a basidium is formed on a gill, and here is a representation of that gill, and that tissue will uh, differentiate into basidium, and those basidiums will give rise to basidiospores. When those are matured, the spores will then be either airborne or carried by different um, animals or wind, wind, water, et cetera. And when they, the spores germinate um, under certain conditions, this may mean the right temperature, the right humidity, or you know, the, that they're close by uh, a particular tree, for example. So under these conditions, that spore will germinate will make that microscopic, thread-like hyphae that will grow into this huge network uh, of mycelia. And then from there, that mycelia starts differentiating uh, into a button and on the different parts of the mushroom, in this case, a stalk. So you, that mycelium will grow and grow and differentiate, start first as a little ball, like a little potato, uh, that will differentiate into a stalk, um, and a cap. And depending on what kind of mushroom we're talking about, there may be different structures in here, either gills on that cap or pore, pores or teeth. Um, and then from there on, the, this mushroom will develop, mature, and those spores will become mature and the cycle will continue. So the other group of uh, fungi that I want to introduce you to is to the um, ascomycota. Um, and an example here is those uh, morels in the spring. So the big difference between basidiomycota and ascomycota is the way that those spores are formed. So the spores will be formed on little sacs that in mycolog mycological terms we call uh, ascus. And therefore, those sacs contain ascospores. Likewise, those ascospores are either uh, forcibly discharged, picked up by wind, or splashed by water, and then that spore will reach um, the next location under the right condition. This spore will germinate, create that hyphae and that network of hyphae that we call mycelium. Sometimes, like the morchellas, the morels, uh, that mycelium first will make this really hard uh, structure that helps it over winter and protect it from uh, inclement weather. Sometimes, uh, depending on the um, environmental conditions, this fungi will stay as sclerotia, as this little ball of really tight mycelium that is hard and very small. It will stay as a sclerotium in the soil for many, many months or you know, um, years sometimes. And under the right conditions, then this sclerotia can start to develop into mycelium and grow um, in, in the forest. And from there, it can then build a fruiting body. This is one of the reasons why um, morels are hard to grow uh, indoors because it's hard to break the cycle from going from mycelia to sclerotium to fruiting body, but 
but it's not impossible. People do have uh, cracked that down and produce morels and doors. So when you compare between those two groups of mushrooms that I'm describing, of fungi, the ascomycota normally will have a cup or saucer shape um, type of um, look, uh, sometimes with cavities or lobes. Um, in terms of stalk, sometimes what, for ascomycota, you normally don't have a stalk or have a very small stalk. Um, you can have for both Ascomycota and Basidiomycota. It's important that you know and note as you look at the mushrooms if they are appearing as a single organism or you have clusters of mushrooms. Uh, knowing the habitat is going to help you through the identification too. Is it associated with wood, a living tree, lawn, soil, etc.? Um, and it's very important that you know about the location, the geographical area. And this guide that we develop is Iowa specific, Iowa centric. So it captures all the different mushrooms that are uh, very common, the most common um, in Iowa. Now for Basidiomycota, the other two that you want to look for is the presence or absence of the universal veil. And if the cap has a gill, pores, teeth, or tubes, all those are very important when identifying um, Basidiomycota. All this to say, identification is key. Nevertheless, a complex process, but to be honest, it's a great hobby if you have the patience for it. I recommend that you take lots of photos before collecting the specimen so that then you can go through and answer the questions uh, that Dichotomous Key will ask you either from a book or a website. Normally we'll follow through, did you find a stalk? Did the stalk had a little ring? What did you find uh, if you dig around the specimen? Was the base of the stalk enlarged or not? This is the type of questions that the key, as you key out a mushroom, you need to answer. So thanks uh, that Oh, yes. So important things that you need to look for is the shape of the mushroom. Uh, is it a typical Basidiomycota with a stem and a cap? Um, and what is the shape? We have multiple shapes in here where the cap could be kind of convex, uh, with the top being uh, smaller than the base of the cap. Uh, or it could be the other way around, like it's, it's backwards. Um, now, what are the parts? Does it have a stem? Again, if, you, if the cap, does it have gills or teeth, or are you seeing pores? Um, then it's very good to learn how to make a spore print because this differentiates a lot of lookalikes. Uh, mushrooms can look very much alike, and sometimes uh, we need to differentiate it based on the spore print and other characteristics to make sure that we're not eating the poisonous lookalike. Odor is important. Chemical reaction is something that I use very much in the clinic. We use KOH and other um, reagents to make sure that we follow all the keys. And there are many, many more. So I don't want to scare you, but this is a very, uh, very scientifically based process, but it can be very fun. It's like a lot of detective work. You collect all this, all this clues and then you will um, reach your answer. So all this, I will recommend that you would become uh, familiar with using a dichotomous key. There's a lot of books and there is a lot of keys online. So here's some of my recommendations um, for, in general for mushroom ID is make sure that you're collecting it carefully. Um, use a little bit of a, a trowel. Um, make sure that you take lots of photos. Take with you, learn which ones are the best field guides and online resources. Here I have a handful of my favorite ones. Uh, I rely a lot on the um, Dr. T, uh, mushrooms and other fungi of the mid-continental United States, love that one. If I'm gonna head in the woods, um, I love this Mushrooms in Your Pocket, a guide to mushrooms of, of Iowa. And if you wanna get more into bigger books, 
Uh, the mushroom domestified is really good and the mushroom of Northern, uh, North America are, is also very, very good. Now, our guide, Safe Mushroom Foraging, is intended for you to have fun with your kids too. Um, so that's why we made it short, small, and very, very visual. Uh, and again, you can download this one to your phone or um, order the paper copy. My favorite online resource is the Mushroom Expert. I go there very, very often because they have wonderful dichotomous keys. Um, and then it, it explains a lot um, of what is behind the mushroom and how you go about identifying it. And the person is, is a terrific um, guide. And Michael Kuo, um, who is the person that puts together this guide, is actually, he is a teacher that over the years developed all these resources. Um, and it was his hobby. And he does a phenomenal uh, work um, kind of putting all this information out there and getting wonderful photos. Now, if you have heard of iNaturalist, this is a great, great community um, experiment, if you will. You can learn so much in iNaturalist, not only about mushrooms, but about plants and nature in general. So this uh, is one of the many examples where you can become part of a group and learn as a community. Um, you could also consider joining a mushroom club. There is the Prairie States um, Mushroom Club in Iowa. Um, there is also a lot of social media, but make sure that they are reputable. Um, I like especially the ones that do have a moderator uh, that can actually um, confirm something. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have a group for Iowa in iNaturalist. But we do have a lot of mushrooms that are very similar to Minnesota. So you can join the one from Minnesota. I have this one. Uh, I did uh, join the mushroom from Minnesota and I enjoy it really uh, very much because you have your own observations and you have a lot of people that are considered either identifiers because they uh, identify properly uh, a mushroom. And then you could be an observer if you're just starting and taking photos and collecting information. All right, so mushrooms are beautiful. I, I think that there are organisms that we should learn to look at with curiosity, a lot of curiosity. So my question here is, are all mushrooms safe to eat? And the answer is absolutely not. And in some cases, even the ones that we consider edible are not safe to eat. So let's go through some mushroom myths. Definitely, there is a lot of information out there online. Um, and you may find, for example, that all mushrooms are edible. That is false. That all toadstools are poisonous. That is not right. This is false, too. So another one is all mushrooms that grow on wood are safe to eat. White mushrooms are safe to eat. Absolutely not. And I will show you a couple of those examples later on. Now, mushrooms that are eaten by animals are safe for humans. Absolutely not. We have different guts. Cooking, cooking, pickling, and drying poisonous mushrooms will take them, will make them safe to eat. No, not, absolutely not. In fact, sometimes you may end up boiling a toxin that may cause you some trouble too. Mushrooms that change color after being scraped with a silver coin or spoon are safe to eat. No, this is also false. So just beware of information that you find out there, okay? Now in the guide, we have um, made these little symbols to guide you through what is edible, what is toxic, um, and what you may have some sensitivity. So let's go through these things. This little symbol in our guide is called choice edible. Now, the way that we accumulate information about edibility is really experiential. That means that someone, some time ago, decided to taste a little bit and take notes, and then it became popular culture. So it's not a lot of, uh, uh, you know, specific scientific research that says we didn't find any toxin on this mushroom, therefore it's edible. Absolutely not. It's a lot of that experiential accumulated over time and passed down through generations. Now, 
edible mushrooms may be difficult to distinguish from poisonous lookalike species. And this is why in our guide, we have put in there a, a, a line that it says, which ones are the lookalikes you have to look, be on the look for. And the best you can do is to learn the characteristics of the mushrooms that you're looking for, the timing of appearance, habitats, like if they are associated with a particular tree or plant and a particular time of the year, and what are their poisonous lookalikes in general. And again, I cannot emphasize enough, proper identification is key. Do not take any risks. If you have any doubt about the identity of a mushroom, do not eat it, throw it out. Okay, the other issue here is that a lot of reports, there are a considerable number of poisonings that occur by eating mushrooms that are considered edible. One example here is morels. People love morels. And some people, you know, would eat morels and get sick. So there are some things here to consider. Let's start with, you know, the same way that in our, us humans, we may have sensitivity or allergies to certain foods. There are people that have some degrees of sensitivity. Uh, so, you know, my sister can eat any mushroom. Well, I have a very hard time eating more else and really any other mushroom. So I, I have to be very careful. Uh, and I want you to be very careful, especially if you are just starting, um, because you may not know what is your sensitivity to mushrooms. So be very careful because you may experience gastrointestinal symptoms or any other uh, poison, poisoning symptoms uh, if your sensitivity to mushrooms is very low. Also, if it, this is the first time that you will be consuming a mushroom, be very careful, careful on the amount that you will be eating it uh, because you want to start small to make sure that it's not upsetting your belly. For example, for morels or other things that are considered edibles. But children tend to be more vulnerable than adults to having an upset tummy. So be very careful if you decide to uh, go out with your kids um, hunting for mushrooms and bringing them back for dinner. Be very careful with your kids. The other problem is if you are eating old or rotten mushrooms, you may have collected the mushroom and you didn't notice that it had a little uh, bruise or a slimy part. Uh, and it got un unnoticed and it made it to the pan and it turns out that that rotten part, mushrooms get bacteria and other uh, fungi eating them. And bacteria and mushroom can cause uh, some, well, they can produce some toxin or they can cause some secondary metabolites that will cause uh, some problems to your system. So be very careful. The other part is making sure that you are cooking those mushrooms that you have identified properly um, and you're cooking them to the point that you feel comfortable and that are completely cooked through. If you eat raw mushrooms, mushrooms are made out of, their, their cell walls are made out of uh, chitin and a lot of other compounds that are hard to digest in general uh, for our systems. So when you cook them, just like when we eat meat, when you add that heat, you're helping those uh, compounds, proteins, and all these things that make the beef or to make the pork or whatever meat you're eating. Likewise, when you're cooking a mushroom, you're helping those compounds break down and make them easy to digest. Now, be very careful eating mixtures of mushrooms because you need to make sure to look at every single one of the mushrooms, make sure that you identify them properly. If, if one of them, you're not sure, but it got mixed in with all the others, that will be enough to cause some problems. The other part is, even if we, if we know by, you know, their common folklore that a mushroom is edible, if you're drinking alcohol, that will make things complicated because al the alcohol can cross-react with some of the secondary um, compounds that you may find on a, on a mushroom that on their own 
they're fine. But once you put alcohol into the mix, then things become complicated. And the truth is, even there are reports of poisonings where the person, you know, had alcohol five days in the vicinity of, of having that mushroom and it made it really worse. They look at the photos, the mushroom was edible, but the person had uh, some alcohol uh, with that particular mushroom. And like I said, getting those mushrooms handled and stored properly so that you're avoiding any decay, bacteria, fungi, or yeast causing trouble on the mushroom, causing decay on the mushroom uh, will be very important. Therefore, avoid using plastic bags when you are carrying your precious cargo back to home. Um, use paper bags, uh, you can use wax papers, uh, you can use uh, something where there is enough airflow, like a lot of morel mushrooms will carry um, mesh bags so that there's no humidity for that yeast, bacteria, or other fungi to cause problems and decay those mushrooms. Okay. Now, mushrooms are wonderful organisms to the point that they can absorb and break down a lot of different uh, nutrients present in nature. And unfortunately, that sometimes that means contaminants for us. So those, in fact, a lot of fungi and mushrooms in general are used to capture contaminants from water or soil, any site. Uh, if so, uh, some mushrooms are used when, uh, for example, there is petroleum spill, uh, and then a mixture of mushrooms will go, will be applied, and capture that. But that doesn't mean that mushrooms can break that down. Sometimes it means that the fungi will keep that content, it's absorbing it and capturing it. Um, and so when you eat a mushroom that had that type of scenario, then you necessarily will be ingesting that contaminant. So steer away uh, from any contaminated soil or sites that may contain heavy metals, soil pollutants, uh, any chemical compounds, engine exhaust like nightmare to uh, train tracks, uh, or fungicides and herbicides in lawns or old orchards. Um, because a lot of, especially back in the 50s and even before, there was a lot of um, products that we use that we didn't know they will stay so long in the environment, like arsenic, for example. Um, so be very careful of where you are hunting for mushrooms and then you know the story, you know, what, what was the history of that particular site? All right, and the guide, we use this symbol for uh, not edible and this will mean that the texture or the flavor makes it a not good to eat mushroom. Now in our little booklet, we use toxicity unknown simply because we don't have information on any toxic compounds, neither generational uh, folklore accumulated on that particular mushroom, but the recommendation is to avoid. And we use this little icon. Um, when we know that that mushroom is known to cause discomfort, illness, or even death if eaten. Um, so we, we know a lot of mushrooms that cause so many trouble that people went into looking into what toxic compounds were produced by that mushroom. Uh, and there's a lot of toxin types. Um, and this types even can vary depending on where you found this mushroom. If you go to the West Coast, the toxin of a gyromitra may be different to what you find here in Iowa. But this could also be true depending on the year or the strain present uh, on the area, the strain of that mushroom or fungi um, present in the area. Now keep in mind that uh, symptoms of poisoning may develop from minutes since you consume the mushroom, from days to weeks. And this could be a rapid, very acute, to a very chronic process. Some mushrooms don't cause uh, acute symptoms, but they will cause cumulative problems that in the end, you may develop cancer um, over a period of time or other neurological problems. Now, when it comes to hunting mushrooms, we have a, a short video that uh, you can watch, but it's all about um, what we have on page 11 uh, in the guide. 
some uh, good um, recommendations that we have for you on what to take and what are the best practices. So when I hunt, this is what I take with me. I have a little basket. I, I will carry either the common trees of Iowa, the little booklet, or I download it in my phone. Um, you know, whenever you go hunting for mushrooms, ticks are present most likely, so be aware of that. Um, I take a good camera, some parchment paper. Um, I will take a um, magnifying glass and a ruler uh, to look for specific characteristics, the ruler, so that I can take pictures and get good estimates of the size. Um, and something to kind of clean my hands when I'm handling different specimens. I don't want to, again, contaminate any specimens. So I make sure that I will be packing them individually. Um, what else I'm missing? Something to eat. Uh, you don't know if you may get lost. Um, a GPS, I use my phone a lot. Water um, and anything else that uh, you think may help you. I, I carry um, alcohol wipes to clean my trowel or my knife uh, to disinfect also. But you know, in the woods anything can happen and I have fallen once. And you know, if you have to do something for yourself, you got a little bit of uh, a mini uh, aid, uh, first aid kit with you that you can improvise. As far as best practices, always respect private property and learn to correctly identify mushrooms uh, that you're looking for to eat from their poisonous lookalikes. That's the, my best recommendation is use this guide and, and use any resources to learn what you're looking for. That will help you get started and learn to identify those that you're looking for. Avoid over mature specimens or any specimen that has any uh, signs of damage or, or you may find larvae inside, insect larvae or sliminess, leave those behind. Always harvest above the soil level. You don't want to carry any soil with you because the soil will have bacteria, yeast, and other things that can jump into your specimens and start decaying them. Likewise, I recommend that you remove and clean the dirt, any debris from the mushroom because you don't want uh, contamination. And I do use a clean uh, soft brush uh, and I use those alcohol wipes to clean that soft brush if I had to, you know, if I use it after I use it, I clean it and then I'm ready for the next. Um, store your harvest mushrooms in paper bags or wax paper while in transit and avoid plastic bags because they will retain moisture and promote decay. Uh, like I said, keep your specimens wrapped and packed separately to avoid cross-contamination and keep from direct sun or hot temperatures because that will also contribute to decay and refrigerate soon after harvest. Okay, so all this information again is in the guide. The other nifty thing we have included in the guide is we put a mushroom calendar. So a lot of people think, okay, I hunt for morels and I'm done. Well, the truth is there's a lot of good edibles, very easy to identify after you have studied a little bit that you can take advantage of. So the guy does have a um, mushroom calendar. There, there are two pages of it um, that you can consult and then you can go uh, from there to the page of a particular um, mushroom on the guide. Now we also have created mobile responsive calendars. So if you go to this uh, ipm.istate.edu and type the mushroom calendar specific for Iowa and the Midwestern states, you will be able to see um, that particular calendar. And we have a calendar for spring, one for summer and one for the fall so that you can look at it in, or in your phone. Know when a particular mushroom is gonna be most likely out there in the forest. Okay, so this is where we're getting to the best part of the webinar. Um, the guide has about 57 mushrooms, but today we're gonna focus on 18 mushrooms, some of the most common mushrooms that we get questions at the clinic during the fall, uh, and some of the ones that uh, we have included edible ones, poisonous ones and some that one that we don't know the toxicity that we rather you not take the chance and one that we absolutely know is not recommended is it's just uh, too bitter to be eaten 
Okay. Let's start with puffballs. So this little guy is here. Um, we know them as puffballs. The scientific name is Lycoperdum. That's the genera. Um, and if it has a little last name, there's many last names or different species of Lycoperdum. Many different puffballs. So this one is considered a choice or edible, especially when you find it young. Young is very important. As they age, they become not edible. They become brownish uh, and they're not recommended. So these guys are normally pear-shaped. Um, they can come with a stalk like this one in the photo or not. Um, now there's spore, the spore mass. If you get to see the spore mass, this little guy is too past when it was good eats. Um, because you want to be eating it again when it is completely white and young. White fern flesh is considered choice edible. As they age, they are not recommended. This guys, you will find them in the ground of a forest, near to down logs or stumps, um, and in wooded or grassy areas. And this one is one that you can find now and into mid-November, weather permitting, really. Um, if there's enough moisture in, in the woods, in the forest, you may be able to find this little guy. Now, if you're out with your kids and you find one of this one um, that is mature and it is brown, there's nothing more satisfying than touching it because you will see the spores uh, become this uh, cloud, a brown, a brown cloud that comes out of a, of a pore right in the center. And when it comes to puffballs, you want to be aware of lookalikes. Scleroderma, which we were going to cover next, is one that you want to be very careful because those are poisonous. And also, some reports of people confusing young uh, ammonitas that are, most ammonitas are toxic. So you've got to be very, very careful with those and make sure that you are learning. This little guys, those lycoperdums, have very specific characteristics, those little hairs. Um, kind of poking out of, of their um, outer skin. So now let's compare this puffballs, the lycoperdum ones, with the hard puffballs or earth balls that we know. So the example that I have here is that is chloroderma. Be very careful with this one. The big difference here is when you touch a lycoperdum or a puffball, those are soft. Um, when you touch a scleroderma, Unless it's young or certain species of scleroderma, you may, these guys are hard. Um, again, be, be aware of scleroderma that are young and that may feel very soft because you may be in trouble there. Now, the scleroderma are known to be uh, mutualistic and beneficial in the woods. Um, they are round to elliptical. And when you cut them in half, they are brown to brown purple, purple uh, to purple black in the inside. And some species will have those markings like this one does. Um, and some of them that will have that outer ring, uh, outer ring like this one does. This one you will find on grounds, um, in the forest, or in wooded lawns. And you'll find it overlapping with black perdum, unfortunately, um, from about June to October. So just be very careful um, with this one. So if you're not sure, if you're touching it and you're thinking, well, it's too young and I, I can't tell if it's gonna develop into, it's changing into brown or purple inside, just leave it behind. Uh, because if, if, if there is a chance that what you may thought, okay, it is white, it's somewhat soft, I think it may be a, a, a lycopernum, it may be a young scleroderma. So be very careful with that. One that we get a lot of questions about is this giant puffball, uh, Calbacia gigantea. This one is considered choice edible, but likewise the lycoperdum, you wanna make sure that if you're gonna eat it, the best is when it's white, firm, uh, and the flesh is firm. Uh, but if you notice that it's changing color to brown, when this ones are mature, they're completely brown. And they're like this uh, dusty, pile of, of spores almost. 
and they are very large. There won't be a stem on them. Depending on the species, you may find like this little uh, cord of mycelia right at the base, and you may find them on meadows or wooded areas. Um, so again, this ones tend to be very large. Just make sure that if you find it, it has to be really fresh and completely white and fleshy. The moment that it started to turn brown, is no good eats. Now let's go to keen bull lead, and we're gonna go through three different bull leads. So bull leads are normally, um, you will see a lot of bull leads. Um, it's, it's more of a higher classification, and people refer to bull leads mainly for the type of mushroom that we're talking about. There's normally a stalk, there is a particular disc cap that is that convex, then you'll have those pores um, right there on the cap. So, this ones tend to be a, a large um, and sturdy fruiting body. The caps are cream to brown. They start changing to um, reddish. And when the, underfair, the under surface is normally white and it starts to become pale to yellow, you will see either tubes or pores as opposed to gills. So these guys are kind of very, very uh, unique on that sense. The spores, if you were to make a spore print, are olive brown, uh, and that stalk is club shaped, so being uh, narrow as it goes towards the cap and wide at the base. Now you'll find this, guys, this uh, King Bolit, the Boletus edulis group, um, on um, normally in the forest and very, very often associated with oaks because it is a mutual beneficial. Um, fungi for, for, that kind of tree, for that kind of tree for oaks. Now, unfortunately, this little guy that is edible, that is considered edible, um, does have a look like the Tylopilus phileus that we'll, we'll see next. Um, and, and the King Bolete, um, you'll see from mid-July to September. Now, the beer Bolete here, this guy is considered not edible simply because it's tart and unpleasant to eat. But likewise, the king bolete is a mutualistic and beneficial um, fungi, but the cap is different in color, is more of a pinkish brown to tan, um, and that uh, under fair, under surface will become pinkish with maturity. Uh, no gills again, we're talking about pores, and uh, you will have that stem that forms a net-like pattern. You can see on this photo here. Remember, it's really bitter, and you do not want to even try this little guy. This one uh, is available from mid-July to September, weather permitting. I love this one. This one, um, Entoloma arbotibum. So this little guy, this white guy here uh, with the red arrow, uh -oh, uh, is the Entoloma arbotibum. Um, now this Entoloma, the species arbotibum, is edible on its own, um, but, it has the ability to parasitize, meaning it will go and eat other types of mushrooms. In this photo here, we have this armillaria, the, the brown mushroom in the background, and the, uh, that is signaled here by the aqua um, arrow. So when armillaria is parasitized by the antoloma, it looks like this mush in here that is, um, uh, signified by the orange uh, arrow. So in this case, where you have the tree players at bay and you can identify the two, the Entoloma arbutivum and the armillaria, in this case, we do consider this choice or edible. The problem is, and what we want to make sure that you understand is, if you don't see the players, then you may end up with a different Entoloma species or a different um, armillaria that is not edible. So just exercise a lot of caution with this, guys, because you may end up in trouble if you end up with a different Entoloma species or what well, was actually parasitized was not an armillaria or was an armillaria that is considered toxic. Now this guy avoided all cost. It is poisonous. It's called a Russula emetica group. Um, it's known as thickener or red bitter gills. Um, 
And you can see here, this guy and the cap, those have some gills. White to cream color, the cap is scarlet red and beautiful, a smooth uh, surface. And the flesh is very brittle to the touch. Um, the stock is white and snap like you were snapping chalk. So it's kind of cool. This one you'll find in the ground in hardwoods. And it looks a lot like any other Russelless. And this one is available right now and through October, but avoid it at all costs. Compare it with the green Russula, which is considered edible. The green Russula is Russula parvovirescens, is a group again. Just like most Russulas, is a mutualist and beneficial, especially to oaks and some other hardwoods. Um, but you see the difference here is you'll have a cap that is more of a convex. You'll have that little top that is narrow. Um, and the cap is green to blue. Uh, and it has some cracks. This photo has the cracks perfectly in there with some raised patches. It's, it's kind of a cool one to find out. Now be very, very careful. There's other lookalikes on that russula. You have to be on the look for the virescence and the gustosa. And some of those russulas, again, can be poisonous. So unless you can identify this properly as a parvovirescence russula, russula parvovirescence, do not eat it or pick it. Now, this um, woolly milk cap or lactarius tormentosus can sometimes trick you and you may think, oh, it's a russula, right? It looks very much like it. Uh, the stem is similar, the gills are similar, the cap does have a similarity, except that it has a more hairy look, like a mat of hairs, and use that to identify it so that you avoid it. The other part is a lot of the lactarius will have this uh, milky juice when you touch it that it kind of drips, that latex that leaks out. But be careful because there are some Ursulas that look a lot like this Lactarius. Now compared to this other Lactarius, this is a Lactarius bulimus uh, or tawny milk cap. This one is actually edible. Uh, what you can see in here is the cap is brown to orange um, and it's relatively um, smooth and you won't have anything, any texture on it. So it's what we call bald. bald. Um, and the stalk will be light orange to brown. Um, so this one will also leak that milky latex. So be careful. And this one is said to have kind of like this uh, fishy smell when it's broken. You'll find this one too under oaks and other hardwoods. And be careful, there's another look like Lactarius curragus that you want to make sure that you know what you're looking for there. Okay, white mushrooms, remember that we had this myth where all white mushrooms were safe to eat? Well, absolutely not. This Amanita vesporigena, or death angel, is deadly poisonous. You'll see the cap is completely soft and bald, no scars or anything, very white. There is a stalk um, here that has this little ring, like this, this little uh, vestigial part of, of the universal veil right there. The gills are free to the stem, so when you look, take a very closer look on the way that the gills are attached to the stalk, they're free. They're not attached directly to the stem. And the spores, you'll need to do a spore print to differentiate this one. Those spores will be white. You'll find this one's on oaks and other hardwoods. And unfortunately, there's a, some lookalikes for this ones that are considered edible. So be very, very careful with ammonitis. They cause horrible symptoms. Now, another poisonous one, very common, a lot of cases of poisoning here, is uh, chlorophyllum molybditis. It used to be called Macrolipiota molybditis. It's one common name, is false parasol or green gill, because the, the gills do have a little bit of that, look, that green look. So the cap is white, have kind of like this patchy look uh, towards the center with those dark scales. And the spores are green, so the spore print is going to be super important for this one. Um, but it, the gills on mature spores, uh, those start changing from green to gray in color. Um, and again, the way that those gills are attached to the stem, it, they're free. They're not completely attached. There's a little gap, and that is important. Um, again, Lots of lookalikes and some of them that are edible. So make sure that you recognize this bad boy because you do not want to run into problems with this one. It's really a bad poisonous one. 
Another white mushroom to avoid at all costs, the Lepiota cristata, um, known as stinking parasol or stinking daffodil. Uh, this guy has that cap with that cream to color, reddish brown scales on them. The stem is very smooth, bare, really soft, um, but it has a very fragile ring, so it may not be there when you are trying to identify it because it may have fallen already. Again, gills are free from the stem, and it says, people say that it uh, smells like a burnt rubber when you split it. Uh, you'll find this one's on the ground in woods uh, and wooded yards, and there's a lot of other Lepiora species, Leucopotinus, which is not good. Uh, some of those can be edible, and Leuco agaricus, some of those can be edible. So make, make uh, uh, friends, frenemies with this one, and never, never eat it because it's very poisonous. All right. This is one of those that is considered edible, but look how much this white mushroom looks like some of the ones that I just showed you. So this one is the white dappling or white agaricus mushroom. It's the Lego agaricus leucothetis. Um, and the cap is white, very smooth. The stalk is club shaped and, and that thick ring, this in here, I hope you see my mouse. Um, is, is, is very often right there. You'll find this in lawns. We do get some submissions for that uh, and any, any other grassy areas uh, and especially near conifers. Localikes, amanitas, and chlorophyllus molliditis. So be very, very careful. If you're not sure that this is the Leucocaricus leucothetis, leave it behind. It's not worth the chance because I just show you so many white mushrooms that look like this one. Now, this flat top agaricus or agaricus plecomyces is also known to be very poisonous. You see that the cap is flat in this one on the right, show it really good. The middle is dark brown, usually with some scales uh, or fibers, and it feels very dry to the touch. Uh, the gills are free from the stem uh, and they are pink, becoming dark brown as they mature. That stalk. Um, has a substantial ring, as you can see on the specimen on the left. Um, and then the base of the stalk, this color is yellow when you scratch that. When you do the spore print for this one, this dark chocolate brown, very, very important, and you'll see why in a minute. This one uh, will be found on woodlands or yards with hardwood or conifer trees. Uh, and there's a lot of other agaricus that look like this little guy here. You'll find it from mid-June to October. All right, another agaricus, but this one is a good guy. Just look how much uh, this one looks like the one I just showed you. Um, so this one is choice edible. Uh, it's considered a saprobe or decomposer. The cap is white. Uh, it has those bright pink gills when young, uh, dark chocolate brown when the spores are developed. And that will be also the way that the uh, spore print looks like. The gills are free from the stalk. The stalk would have that substantial uh, ring, so it makes it very, very similar uh, to the one that I was uh, just showing you, the flat top agaricus here. So be very, very careful. You'll find it also in grassy areas, lawn, postures, fields, and sometimes you'll see them on fairy rings that are these beautiful circles that look like there is uh, a witch, uh, witch makings on, on your backyard. Now, fortunately, it looks a lot like Nida, like Agaricus, and like that green parasol, the chlor uh, Chlorophylla molybdites. So be very careful with that one. All right, we're getting to the last couple here. We got some of the yellow ones, chanterelles. People love chanterelles. You'll find that these guys uh, have a caps that are flat, the funnel shape. Um, you will find shades of yellow for this one, sometimes orange. Uh, the thick gills uh, like ridges. So look at the specimen here. Those are very thick gills. Normally gills are very thin. Um, it's hard to delicate and you break them really easily. These guys are, are pretty, pretty tough and, and um, they look more like ridges than gills. And they will continue to um, extend far way down to the stalk in here. You will find these guys singly, so one or in clumps in the ground, um, on hardwoods and sometimes in troops. Unfortunately, sometimes people can confuse this with Amphiletus eludens, but once you get really good at um, knowing what you're looking for, you, you may not confuse it, but 
if you're starting, be very, very careful with this, guys. Uh, and you'll find this, guys, from mid-June to a little bit into August. Now, one that had caught the attention of a lot of people, this Clarotus citrinopiliatus, or golden oyster, is a mushroom that you will find in you know, Amazon as a kit to grow on your own. It's originally from Asia, um, and it's not considered to be native to the United States. It seems that it has escaped from someone growing, her, growing it in their you know, basement or backyard into our forest, and that is unfortunate, but it's considered choice edible. Uh, and a lot of people say it tastes very good. So just keep in mind for this, guys, the caps are brown to bright yellow, a lot, well, similar to the chanterelles to some extent. Um, the stems are white, usually bent, like you can see in this uh, photo here. The gills are close together, which is very different to the chanterelles, um, and extend down the stalk. And I, I've seen a couple of these guys, and then sometimes they can make a really thick stalk, and then you'll see many, many uh, of this uh, type of shooting smaller stalk and caps from that main stalk. So they grow in overlapping cluster on the cane hardwoods, and sometimes you may find them in the ground, which makes sometimes for a confusing um, thing. All right, so this is the guy to watch out for. Avoid jack-o'-lantern mushrooms or Oncolotus illudens. This one is available from July to mid-October. It's bright yellow to orange in both surfaces, so that is super important. If you think about the, um, golden oyster, the underside was lighter, okay? The amphalot is going to be yellow or orange in both sides, so that's very important. Now those uh, gills are narrow, um, and they go along here. They see that the attachment to um, the stem is very similar to the other two, um, the chanterelles or the fleurotis. Um, this guys will grow in dense clusters uh, from stumps and roots, um, and uh, this could be mainly associated with uh, hardwood trees. They're very good at decomposing dead trees, dead and dying trees, especially oaks. Some people, when you look in the literature, you'll say, oh, they, it looks like led to forest souls furious. I think that may be for the untrained eye, but it's good to keep an eye on that. Definitely like chanterelle and to some extent to the pleurotus. Something really cool about this one is that they, it, it will become luminescent in the dark if it's fresh. Um, so that is pretty fantastic to see. Uh, but if you happen to ingest a little bit of this guy and avoid it at all cost, but if you do, you'll have terrible gastrointestinal symptoms because there's a toxin that this particular mushroom will produce. Okay. Let's see. Oh, and unfortunately, the spore print will not help us here either because the spore print will be white, just like the pleurotus. So just be very careful. Remember to look on the underside. That's the main difference. Uh, and if you get to do it, that looking at, at this mushroom glow in the dark is phenomenal. All right. Uh, we have uh, an example of an erysium. The one that is most common in Iowa is this uh, erysium americanum. Uh, known as Beer's Head Tooth Fungus. Uh, this one is known to be saprophytic uh, and decomposer, but also cause uh, problems uh, being a parasite on trees, and it is definitely a choice or edible. This one is super cool. I think it has that white branched look to it, like long spines that hang down from the branches. It's really cool. It's almost like icicles, but tiny icicles. It grows on stumps, um, dead hardwood logs, also growing on uh, wounds of hardwoods. And there are very many species of, of erysium. This will become uh, more and more available from August to October if we get uh, really good moisture out there. Now, the hen of the woods or sheep's head or maitake, uh, Grifola from Dosa, is also an excellent eat, considered an excellent eat. Uh, this cap is tightly packed um, and it is attached by this uh, branches of rosettes that are kind of all close together. Um, so it's like this, this very small fan great caps that lead to a central stem. Uh, the undersurface is white uh, and is composed of tubes and pores, so no gills. These guys are polypores, a very different type of mushroom. 
Uh, you will find this, guys, on stumps of oak trees, and it looks a lot like the Mary of Sini, or the black stain in polypore. And it's available or found in the woods from August to October. All right, we're almost there here. This is the last one, very easy to identify. Get familiar with this one. Hat is famous for being really tasty uh, and is a sulfur shell for chicken of the woods. The latus porus um, sulfureus. Uh, and you'll have various shades of bright sulfur yellow to orange, and the underside uh, is yellow. And you'll see tubes with those little pores, no gills in here. Now, again, careful a lot in the literature. People said in, in their re recordings that people have mistaken uh, Omphalos eludens uh, for this uh, chicken of the woods, so that jack lantern mushroom. So don't make that mistake. This one is available from mid June to October. All right, so to wrap up here, um, you can uh, download our safe mushroom foraging guide with the 57 common mushrooms in Iowa for free as a PDF. It's very, it works really good on your phone. Um, and you can download that free as a PDF. You can get a paper copy for uh, $4 plus shipping um, for, uh, you know, a Christmas gift. Now, very quickly here, we do have a few minutes for questions. Um, and then I have a, a few concluding remarks and I will give you a site to remember for next spring if you're interested in certifying to sell um, morel mushrooms and potentially other mushrooms. So, Caitlin, is there any questions in the chat or any burning questions from anyone? Yeah, so we have one question so far. Um, somebody asked, can you find an orange pleurotus or is that not a pleurotus when it's orange from the stalk to the cap? Yeah, I think the key in there is that the uh, golden oyster, the uh, pleurotus trinopiliatus, is going to be white on the underside. So that is, that is very, very important. Um, if if it's not, even if it's orange or yellow, um, the gills and the stem are orange or yellow, then it's most likely the omphalitis, uh, and this, that will be the toxic one. In the meantime, the golden oyster mushroom seems to behave invasively. Does it pose a threat to nephip mushroom species? Very good question. Um, yeah, so we, I don't think that has been established. But yes, you are correct that once a species become has that productivity, so and this is true with all the pleurotas, they are they produce massive amount of spores. So they have this imminent uh, ability to take over an ecosystem, and therefore there are chances that these mushrooms are going to start the oyster mushrooms are going to start taking ecological spots from other mushrooms. Yes, it is very possible. If uh, you're interested on the training to become certified to sell morel mushrooms, you can just go to that bit.ly slash morel cert. Normally at the beginning of the year in January or February, we have the dates. Uh, and there may be a chance that some more mushrooms are going to be added to the certification, depending on the rulings that will come uh, from the Departments of Inspections and Appeals. All right, so just to conclude, if by any chance you're in doubt, you're not sure what you have in front of you, you can identify it. In doubt, throw it out. Don't take any risks. This is your health and the health of your family. And you may think, oh yeah, I just get a stomach upset. But remember, a lot of this poison in the mushrooms can be deadly. So be very, very careful. And always remember, mushrooms are beautiful and fun. So enjoy them out there. Take our guide, take it in your phone, or if you like the paper copy, get it with you and go out and enjoy the woods. Have fun this fall. Um, and with that, um, the book does have some resources uh, that you may enjoy at the back of the book. Uh, and I have to uh, thank uh, Caitlin, uh, Oliver, and Julie for all their help. Also my collaborators, uh, uh, Lord Leandro and Roseanne Healy, who helped incredibly with this publication. And we hope that you all enjoy the publication learn more about mushrooms, and more than anything, do not take any unnecessary risks. Thanks for joining us, and have fun in the woods.